Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 448. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because what is interesting about all of us as entrepreneurs is that our journey <laughs> is anything but a straight line. And you never know really where the inspiration is going to come from for your next business idea or how you're going to go out there and influence the world. Many of us start out in places that you would just never, ever suspect and then one day we just appear to the world as, quote unquote, the finished product or really the product still under construction, but the world now knows us and, and looks at us as a finished product. And I think today's guest is going to give you some insight, not only into pivoting, not only into understanding things that you may not consciously be thinking about all the time, but also understanding the world from a completely different perspective, but most importantly, understanding why you can be a part of it, why the things that you're passionate about can actually make a difference, and most importantly, why you need to speak up and say what's really on your mind. I, I want you to, to pay attention, because I have with me today none other than Kevin Van Eckeren. Now, you're like, Kevin Van Eckeren. Have I heard that name before? It's because you probably know of his podcast right? TheStateOfLogic.com. Now, here's my point. What I want you to do is I want you to pay attention. I want you to hear his journey. I want you to understand, <laughs> honestly, what being a member of the SWAT team, farming, and investing all have in common. This is going to be interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Kevin Van Eckeren. Kevin, you there? Jay, thanks so much for having me on. You are quite welcome, sir. Glad that you are indeed here. So, you know I got a lot of questions for you, but before we get there, I got a basic question for you. The same question I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. You ready? I am. All right. So, Kevin, I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, like Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. And I tend to think that entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them is the fact that as an entrepreneur, there's times where I can envision myself, you know, getting dressed up, possibly wearing a cape and saving people in various different ways and forms. But also, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about, say, Spider-Man, for example, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, taking some photos, trying to earn some pizza money, doing his thing. And then one day he gets bit by a spider and discovers that, hey, I've got superhero powers. And now he has to choose whether he's going to use them for good or for evil. So my question to you is as follows. Before your business, before your podcast, before the SWAT team, <laughs> before all the things that people know you for today, what we want to know is, who is Kevin Van Eckeren? Uh, that is a, an, an amazing question that I am not sure I know how to answer effectively, but I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> um, I was uh, the kid in school who um, I, I was severely dyslexic. Um, and didn't really learn how to read until I was in fifth grade. It really struggled with all that. And so I was always in my head and always coming up with ideas and always entrepreneurial. And so, um, you know, I, I started writing a book about all the different ideas I had. And now it's, it's two books. And as I look back to those younger years, I came up with some ideas that 
if at 10 years old I, I had implemented properly, I might have come up with that business that is now successful today. Mm. Uh, and that's when I realized going through that and seeing that those ideas were successful that's, and someone else executed, now I needed to learn how to execute. And that's what I did through college and then my time with the SWAT team. Okay, now, just just so you know, we really got to talk about the SWAT team. But before we get there, because <laughs> I, I feel like there was a path that even happens before the SWAT team. I don't know many people who go wake up one day and go, hey, I want to be on the SWAT team, let alone, hey, I want to be a podcaster. There's definitely a path, and I want to understand that journey a little bit more. Uh, what, so what was that like? I know, you know, you mentioned about being uh, dyslexic in school and and all of those things. So I'm going to assume that that school wasn't a, a joyous place for you at the moment. And then it became so later because you went to university after. Yes. So school was not fun for me, even in college. I mean, I had fun in college, but the school part was not fun. <laughs> That's a different um, podcast, but yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, it's called booze before noon. Um, yeah. And so essentially what I, um, what I really learned from college was actually not the schooling itself, but what the schooling forced me to do, which was to do ride-alongs for mm. extra credit and for internships. Mm. And as I started to ride with the police and understand their world more, I then began to understand how to be a leader, how to uh, think things through in a much more critical way. And those those skills on top of that already entrepreneurial spirit is what led me down – the road of joining a SWAT team as a civilian, so I was a logistics officer, and then moving forward with business. Got it, got it. So I have an interesting question for you then, because what you are alluding to is what I would call the apprenticeship model versus the, we'll call it the industrial age idea of the university. Because what I'm hearing is you actually learned more in the terms of you, more was caught than actually taught in, in a classroom environment. Absolutely. Uh, that is something that I believe very strongly in. You have to experience things, at least from my point of view. Uh, others are different, of course. But for me, I have to experience them to really understand them. Right, right. Okay, so when it comes down to it, w with in your time, you know, with the, the ride-alongs, etc., would you say that would be the most valuable piece of the higher education you've experienced? Absolutely. Uh, between... The 2,000 hours I did in college mm -hmm. and the 8,000 hours I did after college mm -hmm. around the country, uh, it was without a doubt the best education I could have ever gotten. Interesting. So what would you say was like the thing? What was it that you were able to catch than, than actually you know read in a book? It was understanding that the world is not as everyone wants us to believe. Um, and Whoa, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, I think that we all need to understand that the world is much more complicated and nuanced than we would be led to believe by historians, by entrepreneurs who are telling their story, and by actually experiencing that and understanding it and making the mistakes to say, oh, crap, I, I need to learn from that problem. That is what I think a real education about any topic um, deserves. Interesting. Okay, got it. So if you were, you know, to, to be asked very directly, um, for most people who are looking to become an entrepreneur, is it better just to find a mentor or is there something that they, they could benefit from from going to a university? I happen to believe that um, the university system is getting worse and worse, in my opinion. What does that mean? Getting um, worse and worse? This uh, is all, I mean, I've, well, I didn't know it had changed, so it, I think it's always been that way. But you're saying it's getting worse than what it was before, so this is interesting. Yeah, so, so the, the, experience I'm, the experience I'm having through many of my investments, which are in the collegiate space, okay. and my understanding of just social issues and all that, is that often we are we are protecting our students more and not teaching them how to think instead we are teaching them what to think mm -hmm. and the entire purpose of of university in my opinion is learning how to think and how to crit 
critically think, and that is no longer being taught. And I think that is what really worries me. Wow. Okay. Um, so let's dig on this a little bit. Give me an example of something that you've seen where someone was being taught what to think versus how to think. So, so this is the concept, and and it's a much broader concept than one individual um, issue. Mm-hmm. But the concept of safe spaces and trigger warnings and all that is is a concern in the sense that we need to find a happy medium. These things are not all bad, but we need to be able to allow people to act like adults as they are adults in college mm-hmm. and teach them how to process information, what, how, no matter how disturbing or, or uh, tantalizing or whatever that information is, we need to be able to teach them right, how to process that information in the most logical, analytical, and um, detail-oriented way so that they can come to the correct conclusion that works best for them. Um, the the concern with things like safe spaces and all that is simply that uh, we are not preparing our children, our next generation, to be a great part of the workforce. Mm-hmm. And if everyone is scared mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. a word can be seen as violence, how are we ever going to get anything done? Interesting. Now, let's pretend for a moment that myself and most people listening, we don't even know what safe spaces or trigger warnings are. Oh. (laughs) What is that? So, um, yeah, so safe spaces in universities are places where you can go to talk to a counselor for free after um, a Ben Shapiro, for example goes to speak or, or Jordan Peterson goes to speak at their campus. They are offended so much by what that person has said that now they must go see a counselor to, to deal with the, the, the implications of what was said. Now, mind you, these people are very moderate, nice people who may have a different opinion, but they're not the leader of the KKK or anything. Uh, they're not bad people and they're not spreading evil ideology. And then trigger warnings are in any class – when something is brought up, so let's just say sexual assault. Um, if sexual assault is going to be brought up in a book or a movie or in a um, in a conversation, then they first say trigger warning, and then and then say what that trigger warning might be to allow the students that might be affected by hearing the word sexual assault to leave the room, so they don't have to be a part of that discussion. Interesting, and you're saying in in situations like this we're not being given the opportunity to think through that process for ourselves but instead just being told hey this is what you should believe or shouldn't believe about these items and things well i i think it it just speaks to a larger message of if we don't know how if we cannot deal with hearing things we don't like then how are we ever going to determine whether those things that we do or don't like are the right or the wrong thing Got it. Totally understood. So how do we go from this to the SWAT team, my friend? (laughs) Well, we we are talking about violence and both has a lot of them in it. Um, Right. So so I think that that what needs to be understood about my evolution from a university student to the SWAT team was that I studied criminal justice. I still don't know why. It was a it was just interesting, <laughs> but it is the most useless degree on the planet. Nice. Um and and I really enjoyed it. And so I, I said, okay, how can I give back? How can I donate my time? And so I started working as a logistics officer, a civilian for a SWAT team in the south suburbs of Chicago. Uh not the most um you know uh crime free area in in the world. In fact it's it, we have a mm-hmm. lot of crime and, a, and we were being called out pretty much every three days hmm. for a serious incident. Hmm. Wow, that's stressful. So what specifically would a logistic officer do? So every logistics officer has their own role. Uh, for me, it was to professionalize the SWAT team. Uh, that is much like herding cats, unfortunately. <laughs> and so it was a bit of a challenge, but that's where I had to learn to be a leader because I'm the bottom man on the totem pole. I have no power. I'm not actually a cop. I'm not uh, kicking in doors with them, but yet I'm trying to get them to realize that we need 
the training necessary to allow them to survive a deadly encounter. And it's hard to get alpha male guys who have been doing this for 15 years to listen to a 25-year-old college student. But yet you did that. I did. <laughs> so, okay, so there's a story here because there's a number of individuals who are beginning to, to, to start their businesses in various different ways and, and maybe the individuals that they need to actually either as a customer or to bring on board, CFO, CMO, whatever, are sufficiently more senior in years than they are, and but yet they still have to get everybody going in the same direction. So you started a company that was training SWAT teams nationwide. How did you get to the point to where they would actually listen to you and quote unquote take you seriously is usually is the phrase that that said. Sure. So I had to do two things. I had to apply my out of the box thinking because I'm not a police officer to solve the problem of what is best for cops, equipment or training. And uh, so I experimented with both and uh, equipment was great. Uh, you buy them a, an armored vehicle, that's great that it'll stop bullets, but mm. if they don't know how to use it, if they haven't been trained properly, it's a pointless tool. Right. And so once we started training people, we started seeing cops survive deadly encounters at a much higher rate. Good. And that is when we realized this is the thing we need to do. And so I just spread that message in a very authentic and uh, influential way to get people that were 20 years my senior to actually listen to me. Got it. How did you spread the message? What was your, like, medium? Um, well, cops are unique people. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to create a, uh, a prank, of all things. I created a fake company that then turned into a real company, um, messing with a few members of the SWAT team, um, because it's the be cops love pranks, and cops love kind of messing with each other. And so... I created this this fake company and went to all of their customers from the SWAT team and the FBI and the DEA and the Chiefs Association and all that and shut them down for three months. There And they were thinking that I had started my own company and I was just killing them. And really, they never lost a sale. Everyone ordered through them afterwards, all that. But it got everyone's attention. And that's when I said, I'm actually not selling products because they have a product company. Instead, I'm going to be... Uh, hiring the best trainers in the nation to train you guys and other teams across the nation, and I need your help to spread the word. And they happily did that. <laughs> Got it. Wow, that's one way to, to get their attention. Um, so you did that for a little while, but now I really don't understand how this ties into farming. <laughs> You're going to have to... That, <laughs> that's like a really, like, bridge. You got to bridge that gap for me. Absolutely. So... Um, as, as you said, the SWAT world can be very stressful right. and, the, and running a business, as you know, can also be very stressful. So when you combine those, I was stressed to the max and that was not the only company I was a CEO of at the time. So I needed a way to relax and that came in the form of farming. Um, and so I, I started a farm that, that I knew would never make a huge amount of money or anything like that, but it would simply offer me the ability to work on the land, to work with animals, and to produce my own food, uh, all in a very relaxing and satisfying way. Okay, so the the idea was this was your release to just get get away from the 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 busy world of work. Yes, and oh. to manage stress. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Did it turn out to be? successful in managing your stress or did it turn into oh absolutely <laughs> okay got it got it got it got it uh what what would should what should other people farm i mean i mean i i'm curious now because I, you don't hear many people saying i did this this and then i think farming was the way to go so I, <laughs> i'm i'm really curious to understand how the has has the farm grown is it did it end up becoming a business for you i mean what where's the farm at today yeah, so we started off with just uh, 38 chickens, and I just wanted to do it literally as a... Hold on, whoa, 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 a... whoa, 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 stop. You said 30, you started off with, you used the word just and 38 chickens. <laughs> well, most farms have a quarter million chickens when you talk about eggs. Okay. So, 
you know, it, <laughs> it's, it's all a about very perspective, small baby. Operation. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm like one chicken seemed like a lot right now, but okay, go for it. <laughs> so we start off with 38, and obviously I can't eat 38 eggs a day. So I started giving them out, and then restaurant owners somehow got their hands on them and started calling me and asking if I could supply them with eggs. I didn't have a license, I didn't have anything, so I went through the process, and it just started from there. And and now, you know, um, seven years later, we or six years later, we have um, pigs, goats, chickens, cows, ducks, quail, um, and and we produce. Uh, a ton of meat and eggs that are higher quality than anything you can buy in a store. <laughs> you know what I find interesting is that an entrepreneur, no matter how relaxing or how much they, they, they're trying to get away from the, the hustle and bustle of a business, it's like anything that we touch somehow turns into something more than what it started to be. And always, it, always and absolutely. You just can't help but do it. So uh, I'm curious to know, do you do you have a favorite chicken? <laughs> I, mean, I don't, <laughs> I, know I don't anymore, but we do have our favorite duck. Um, and his name is Buddy, and he just follows us everywhere. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I I don't know the first thing about starting a farm, but I, I get the fact that you, you have this thing that everywhere you go, you, you start businesses. Now, now here's another big gap. You 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 have a podcast, The State of Logic, and I really need to hear how all of this ties together. <laughs> Cuz I'm <What>? like <laughs> the, you, the 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 I mean, we've had many people on the show before whose journey has took many turns, but I can't I'm I can't even find a thread for you right now, and I'm trying. Hello there, entrepreneur. This is Jay Massey. I know that if you've ever gone over to the site, cashflowdiary.com, you may have asked yourself, where on earth do you get a domain name from? Especially as you are beginning to build your bigger, better, better business, you need a web presence. You need the email address. You need a way for people to contact you electronically so that you can stop doing the at gmail.com game. Well, the good folks over at GoDaddy have definitely supplied us with every domain that we have ever used. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygodaddy.com forward slash cash flow diary again that's try godaddy.com forward slash cash flow diary because it's a quick way for you to get set up to capture your domain name the exact way that you want it they got easy search functions and most importantly for you is that you'll be up and running today as i said once you get started stay started don't let small little obstacles of how to get your own domain name going stop you so again Go to trygodaddy.com forward slash cash flow diary and let's get back to the rest of the story. <laughs> okay, so um, it, it actually makes sense once you hear it. Basically, about six months into me being a part of the SWAT team, uh, we get called out to a barricaded gunman. That is a lone person in a house with a gun. And mm. when we get out there, uh, we set up the perimeter and uh, I realized I, you know, I had my dog in my car when we got the call, so I brought her with, and oh, I had it running, yeah, and I like take a her canine out. unit. No, 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 just a normal dog. Oh, just okay. my personal dog. I just happen to have her with me. As I said, I'm not a police officer, so there's no reason for me to have a police dog. And right, uh, but it is a German Shepherd's. <laughs> so I take her out of the car, let her go to the bathroom, give her some water, put her back in the car. I go on about my duties for the next five hours. Turns out no one's in there. This happens like 80% of the time, sadly, and so. Uh, go back home. Don't think much of it. Um, later that day, turn on the news, and they show a video of me taking the dog out of the car and saying that there's a hostage situation, and there's the hostage taker has a bomb, and that's why they brought in the bomb dog. What? And I think, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, what? So I call the nightly news producer, and I get a hold of him after about half an hour, and I say, look, I'm the guy in that video. I'm on that SWAT team. That didn't happen. There was no hostage situation. There was no one in the house. That is not my personal dog. You have to run a retraction. You have to do something. And he literally laughed and hung up the phone. And that's when I realized, oh, wait, the media is not out to exactly tell us the truth as much as they want to get eyes and clicks to, to make money. And that's when – that was the kind of antithesis for The State of Logic, my podcast. 
because we need to understand it and learn how to critically think through things instead of just reading a headline and assuming it's 100 percent true wow interesting so they never they literally never did anything about that correct they never did anything well that's not good (laughs) 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 i'm just saying it's not good i mean you know uh Okay, got it. So now, uh, at, as the podcast has been going for you, what what has, or what have been some of the, the popular things that you guys have been talking about? Well, we talk. The beauty of the podcast is that critical thinking covers every aspect of life. So we talk about politics and business and the media and, and kind of all kind of trying to tie it all back to how to think logically, remember to do research, don't just assume things, that kind of thing. And and I think the biggest thing I've taken away from it Mm -hmm. is that this is a rare skill, but those who have it tend to succeed more. Interesting. Now, you say it's a rare skill. Why, Why is that? Why do you believe that? Well, what I find is that Many of the movements we see, whether they be social mm-hmm. or um, political, tend to be based at least part- partly on fiction that was later proven not to be true. Um, and of course, this is not a politics podcast. I'm not going to go into what those are because that would probably be somewhat inflammatory. But the 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 concept still holds the same. And if and I think a lot of business owners and startups especially uh, are going down the road. Of not doing the enough diligence on the idea they have, hmm. trying to implement it, and then losing their life savings, losing fifty thousand dollars or whatever it is, and I think that that's just a a horrible and very hard lesson to learn. Got it, got it. Now that 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 actually brings up something I want to circle back to, because you said a little bit ago that you have investments in the collegiate space. We didn't unpack that then, but let's talk about that now. What is an investment in the collegiate space? Because when I when you say that, the first thing I go is like he's founding colleges. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not founding colleges. That's a great point. I didn't think about that. Basically, it's a uh, I invested. One of my favorites is a company called Black Sheep. They uh, are essentially taking over the school newspaper, and instead, it's their newspaper, and they're in over a hundred colleges. So essentially, they're they're a marketing slash media company. Got it. And they just do that for schools across the U.S. Across the U.S. and and into Canada. And it is one of those things where uh, consumers have been trying to access that market effectively for a very long time with very low results, very poor results. And these guys are doing it at a much higher level, which is exciting. Interesting. And what, how did, okay, you do realize that like, that's a completely different turn again, right? It, I mean, it has literally nothing to do with criminal justice, at least that I can see. It has nothing to do with the SWAT team. Pot, I mean, it's just, you're, you're, I'm trying to find this thread. So what, what inspired that desire so to, I, to I do that? So I think the... The common thread to all of this is business, and the common sense approach to business can be applied to practically anything. Now we're and there. that's exactly what I'm doing with investing is I'll invest in a, in a collegiate media company. I have no idea about the media, and I was probably too drunk in college to remember anything effective <laughs> about that. So it, it's not going to be able to help them as far as that goes, but I, I understand business on a very deep level, and I apply common sense principles to help those people – be, allow them to be the expert in that set industry, and I'm just their backup, their sounding board to allow them to f- suss out ideas and and figure out what's going to work on a broader spectrum. Now we got it. Now I got it. So what I want to know then, what are these common sense principles that are clearly applicable? Whether I want to farm pigs and chickens, um, whether I want to be on a SWAT team and build a training company or invest in collegiate media companies. What what are these common sense business principles that you've discovered? Well, I think first and foremost, you need to understand whether you have an ugly baby. Uh, an ugly baby <laughs> is uh, essentially, we've all seen them, right? You go on Facebook and someone posts a picture of their newborn baby and you're not entirely sure whether that's a newborn baby or a, a new alien race that has been <laughs> discovered. And 
Uh, but but no one obviously would ever tell them that their baby no. is ugly. Never. There's no point to that. Never heard. However, it. Um, there is a point to telling someone that they have a crappy business because you don't want them wasting time, money, and effort on mm-hmm. something that isn't going to be successful. And so, the ugly baby syndrome is when um, friends and family won't tell people that the business isn't going to work. And so it le- comes to us investors to tell them that. And so the the first thing is to re- remain objective, to remove bias, and to determine whether or not your business is actually going to work on a larger scale. And then once you've done that, now it's about hiring people. You need to find what works for you. Um, I personally use um, some very kind of hardcore personality tests and uh, – a long form interview process, slow hire, fire fast is my model as far as hiring and firing people. And then, you know, obviously the third thing is just try and find the exact, the people that are going to be in your executive level that have so much common sense, it almost irritates you and that will allow you to succeed. Got it. Now you said something in that, that I want to dig into because it made me wonder. Um, you said you, is your business going to work on a larger scale? Is there Are there some businesses, in your opinion, that work on a small scale, but that would never work on a larger scale? And therefore, if the entrepreneur is choosing to quote, stay small, they should continue? Oh, of course. But let me be clear that when it's just an idea, mm-hmm. it is just that. It is an idea. Maybe you've made three sales of prototypes. It has to scale from there just to be considered a business. So whether that is a you know a, a family business that produces $100,000 a year on the side or whether that is a $20 billion unicorn, regardless, scale is necessary. Got it. Totally understood. So what would you say uh, with the times of working with the entrepreneurs that you have worked with, what would you say are the common things <clears throat> that uh, have shown that they don't have this common sense? Well, the the biggest thing for me is can someone admit a mistake Hmm. and typically if someone is using logic and common sense and and able to put emotion to the side especially for business purposes then they can say yep that was a mistake and and this is how we fixed it um and so the first thing i do when i talk to a potential investment is all right where are your mistakes and how did you fix them and if they've truly implemented those, you're seeing that business grow from that. Whereas if they understood it's a problem but didn't understand how to solve it or whatever the other issue is, uh, they've implemented something but you saw no change in revenue. Interesting. So I I like the fact that you're starting off with a question like, (laughs) where are your mistakes and how did you fix them? Uh, Because that's not typically the conversation most entrepreneurs want to begin with or even bring up ever. That's right. It is a often my conversations are a little bit more weird and uncomfortable <laughs> than many. Um, but I think that that's what allows us to really get to the nuts and bolts of it and understand not just the process, but the people. So what's more important, the product or the the, the, the people in this case? A hundred percent the people. The product could change drastically. It's the people that have to implement it to make it work. Got it. So to those entrepreneurs that you've run into and or seen who we'll say are um, fixated on perfecting their their process, their product long before they've ever tried to sell it. What what would you what advice would you give them? I think the the biggest thing is perfection is the ultimate enemy of profit. And so uh, once you've done your diligence and that is what whatever that is for your business, who knows, um, then double check. Go to people that don't know you, like investors or business people or whatever that you, that don't have a, an emotional connection with you. Ask them. Once they have the sign-off, once they've given the sign-off, then move forward. And I think uh, that process will grow and mature as uh, your customers tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. I like that. I like that a lot. So um, for those that have listened this far and that they probably want to pick up more of what you've been putting down and find out more about what you're up to, what's going to be the best way for them to to catch up with you? Uh, TheStateOfLogic.com and all of its assorted uh, social media outlets as well. 
Got it. Um, so as we wind down here, I've got a question for you because I've got a, I'm actually really intrigued to hear your answer. Um, let's pretend for a moment that, uh, you know, the, the person listening today is, is actually going to move forward. You know, Kevin, they're actually going to, they're going to make it happen this time. They, they're making decisions. In fact, let's even go so far as to say they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store, ready to pick out their cape and tights, and they're jumping in. They're going to become that entrepreneur, take their business from, you know, that five to six to six to seven, seven to eight figures. They're going to really do it now. My question to you is as follows. You know, like I know, that in those moments of decisions, we often <laughs> are met with the companion, and that companion comes in the form of a voice reminding us of what we can't do, why it won't work. Who are we to ever think that we could do such a thing? That's so crazy. I mean, really? A farm? Who wants that many eggs? I mean, all of these things come to our minds, and then for some people, they're actually related to the person. Uh, that, that, that voice is where it's coming from. So this time, though, they're going to follow through. In fact, they're going to follow through in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? I think the first thing to do is to, as I said, get outside opinions. And once that comes back positive, then I would say estimate that you're going to spend twice as much as whatever you think. And that will still be a low number. Oh, man, do I have stories on that one. Uh, <laughs> totally understood. I completely agree. What I knew it was going to be different. I knew you were going to say something completely different, and you did. Uh, and that's fine. That's that, that's completely fine. So uh, with, with that being said, though, I do want to acknowledge you and thank you uh, for taking the time to share your, your knowledge, your insight, and your wisdom here with us today at the Cashflow Diary, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. Keep up the great work. I've really enjoyed listening, and I can't wait to talk to you soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means the stateoflogic.com. Go subscribe. Go listen to the podcast. Go find out more common sense, because it clearly isn't common. And now you have a place to go pick some up from. What's really cool is that you know, like I know, that business can have principles regardless of industry and you've heard some of them today more importantly i hope you go apply many of them right now ladies and gentlemen it's been fun talking to you today i look forward to talking to you soon until next time 